Good evening. My name is Ryan Collier, and I serve on the board of the Future Forum. On behalf of the Forum and the LBJ Library, I'd like to thank you all for joining us in this incredibly important conversation. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss the issues that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions to introduce each other to ideas and perspectives that we may not be aware of and to always have respectful or be respectful of others' opinions. The Future Forum's events are made possible by the generosity of our members and our sponsors. If you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up tonight or at the very least, visit lbjfutureforum.org for more information. Membership fees go directly toward putting on events like tonight. Before we begin the discussion, keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end of the panel. And like the video said, we have really great food, and so we hope you join us afterwards for food and drink and to continue the conversation. And now I'll turn it over to Alberta Phillips, the editorial writer for the Austin American Statesman and our moderator to introduce our guests. Well, hello there, and welcome. And it's my pleasure to be here tonight to talk with you about a very important topic, the Mayor's Task Force on Institutional Racism and Systemic Inequities. And before I introduce the panel, I just thought I'd read something to you, these words, because they're very important words. And when I read them, they had an impact on me. They kind of told me where we are coming from. For much of my life, I have recognized race as a force in my own life and in our society. And while racism is not the only factor contributing to the diminished capacity of all people, and especially people of color, it is the factor which so many people of power and authority fail to effectively recognize, understand, and or address. And we're witnessing that now. That's my editorial comment up at the Capitol. I agree with so many esteemed Austin voices from throughout the community, suggesting that this time, like no other recently, our city, state, and nation call for us to exchange in a deeper racial truth, promote intra and interracial healing, and foster, foster greater social, educational, and economic well-being. Never had I had such an extraordinary platform, a combination of high-level professionalism, authority, and a deep personal conviction to not only name the societal challenge, but mobilize self and others to address it. I am leading the city in learning how to recognize, understand, and address racism at its various levels, personal, institutional, structure, structural, and systemic. And those are the comments and the words of Mayor Steve Adler, the mayor of the city of Austin, who's sitting second to my left. With that, I introduce him. And first from my left is Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett. She is the president and CEO of Houston Tillotson University, historically black university in this city, and as we like to say, older than UT. Yes. <laughs> and next to the mayor, to his left, is Alba Serrano. She taught me how to roll my R, like <laughs> earlier tonight. She is policy advisor for the city of Austin, and she does many other things. And you'll find out that from her wealth of knowledge this evening. I've, I've heard her on this topic, and she's just so eloquent, as I mentioned to her earlier. And to her left is Brian Oakes. He is the chief equity officer for the city of Austin. And goodness knows, Brian, for some time we've needed an equity officer. And thank goodness that you are here and working in that capacity. And with that, I would like to ask each of you for perhaps, we have, we have so much to cover here, right? We have so much. This is a big report, and it covers five areas. And when I looked at that, I thought, 40 minutes, there's no way. Um, because you, what we really need to do is have a conversation about each of these in a 40-minute forum. We really, truly do. That's how important they are. They cover education and health, banking and finance, housing, and there's one more. Education. Um, education. Thank you. <laughs> From the educator. Uh, so, <laughs> so with that, if you would each just take a minute or two to kind of summarize the thing that you found most important on hopefully different topics, 
And we'll start with Dr. Burnett. First of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's an honor to um, lift the mayor's task for the report. And for me, on a, a very deep personal level, it was to see that these were just everyday common citizens that came together as volunteers mm -hmm. to work towards a very important topic. And the mayor was, I consider it brave enough to name the task force what it, what it is, which was um, a task force on racism because it wasn't about racist people, it's about racist systems. And to put the word racism in the task force, it gets people's attention, first of all. And these are citizens that were just everyday, common, we care and concern from all walks of life, leaders in the community, um, not-for-profit leaders in the community, community activists, people that were really committed to, for the city of Austin, to I heard in the, um, in the video that we were listening to, to make Austin a better place for everyone. Thank you. Mayor? Uh, I, I was most taken, I think, with the realization that while I thought I, I knew this topic really well, uh, and I thought that I knew well its manifestations and where it was, uh, I thought that I knew well how it impacted my life. Uh, and certainly, it's, it's been a huge influence on my life. It's been the subject of a lot of work I've done with the Anti-Defamation League and professionally as a lawyer. Um, I was taken with the session that I had with the facilitator and with the leadership of, that had come together um, to, to work on this, which was an incredible gift to the city, How, that I did not know as much as I thought that I did. Uh, and the number of moments with that group of people that I really sat back on my heels and, and when I, I, I had that wrong. Could you share a little bit more about what uh, finding in which area that might have surprised you most? There were many, uh, uh, but, I'll, but I'll tell you the, the, the exercise that we went through that um, that, that took me. So the question was asked uh, in this group, and it wasn't the first question. You're into the process. You're with a group of people uh, who you hope are going to be the evangelists, the, the Johnny Appleseeds, to then to go back out in the community and, and have this work, which is, which is to a large degree, even though it's systemic, it's, it's personal work. And it's, 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 it's personal work not because we're personally racist people, but in order to change systems and institutions, it really requires that measure of personal commitment. But the question that the, um, the, the person who uh, was leading it uh, asked was, he was talking about racism, and he said, so for each of us, how much has, has racism impacted your life? Uh, it's a simple question, so I started wrestling with that. Obviously, it's a big, big deal, but you know, I you know, looked at other people, and I thought, I'm not going to say that it impacts me as much as it, it impacts the president. So, but it's, it's a big impact, you know. Of course, there are other things that impact it too. I struggled on what my percentage number was. Simple kind of question. And I don't know where I, where I came down on the number. It was, I don't know, it was probably closer to 50% than anything else. Maybe a little bit above that. Uh, and then I wrote that answer, and then I started hearing other people talk about how they perceived that, and, and there really is only one answer to that question, and it's, it's 100%, mm -hmm. because there is nothing that has happened in my life that hasn't been impacted by those, by racism, by the institutions, by the systems, that, that there is nothing in my life that, it, which is not to say, there are not other things that also have impacted my life. Uh, but in answer to that question, how much of my life has been impacted by it, there is only one answer to that question. Thank you. And I would like to ask um, Alba. So as a policy advisor and just as someone who would understand this from a, perhaps a different perspective as the mayor, how would you define institutional racism? That's the question at hand, isn't it? Um, so, you know, aside from being a policy advisor, I also teach social justice um, here at UT at the School of Social Work. And this is a question that I have my students wrestle with um, semester after semester. 
and um, like the mayor's reflection uh, regarding the activity, um, it is difficult um, quite to pinpoint um, exactly where race enters and exits um, as we um, live our daily lives and our daily experience. Um, but I think the, the point of the reflection, the point of the activity, and the point of our task um, as a task force um, was that we live in a racialized society. Um, meaning that there is nothing that we do, nothing in our experience that is not a racialized experience. So who we get to interact with, um, where we get to live, the jobs that we get to have, and then ultimately our life outcomes. This is a racialized process. And so institutional racism um, are the structures that hold that together. And those structures are made of all the people within those structures. Um, and then we get the diverse um, uh, outcomes uh, that we see around us, right, that often puzzle us. Um, so institutional racism yes. is about that racialized experience and the structures that hold that together. And I think it kind of goes back in, to some extent to what the mayor was saying about the 100%, right? I mean, because even if you're not a person of color, you've uh, benefited from racism and institutional racism as being privileged. So it, ha it affects us all and it, and, and it diminishes us all. Mm -hmm. um, it can, it, the acknowledgement of it, the calling it out by its name can benefit us all, but it can also very much diminish us all. So Brian Oaks, you are relatively new to the city of Austin as the first chief equity officer. What can the city do so what we're focused on is to sort of think about how do we take something like institutional racism and really begin to unpack our sort of system or our structure as a city to see where we can make changes to have better outcomes uh, for different uh, races and ethnicities within the city. And so for us, we've really started by focusing on three principles within the city to really get to institutional racism for us. And that is that we're focused on normalizing uh, around equity and race, which is really around developing a shared understanding, making sure that our staff uh, has the competencies and the skill set to really focus on issues like this and do this type of work. So it means um, tackling sort of tough issues like race, right, and talking about that in the workplace and how do we develop training curriculum around uh, actually addressing issues like that or unconscious bias and all those things that we know are layered in, you know, with this topic. Um, we're also focused on um, what I like to call organizing around racial equity, which means that it can't be just one group. Uh, it can't always just be people of color trying to you know, do this work. It really does take a coalition of everyone coming together. And so it's building champions, it's building support, it's building different task forces and teams to really sort of cross, it, uh, cross promote and, and collaborate with each other to really sort of consciously address these issues. And I say last but not least, and, and this is the part that I always kind of feel like is probably not the, the sexiest thing that we do, but we're focused on what I like to call operationalizing around equity uh, and uh, racial equity, which is to think about our policies, our programs, our procedures, and really sort of analyzing how they either help or hurt communities of color at the end of the day. And one of the ways that we're doing that is that uh, we've worked uh, with the community on, the, on what we call co-creative process to develop the city's first uh, equity, racial equity assessment tool. And we have eight departments that are actually piloting uh, the use of this tool right now. And I'd call them courageous because in that tool we're asking some really tough questions around how you do your business uh, as a department. We're asking about do you consciously put dollars towards actually training uh, around uh, addressing issues like racism? We're asking questions around, uh, do you uh, actually sort of set, set goals and look at how you improve staff diversity, right? Um, we're asking tough questions around your community okay. engagement. You, you have given us a lot. <laughs> You've given us a lot, and I, I do wanna take a moment to, to focus on, uh, you talked about an equity tool, was that what you called it? And you talked about policies. 
Now, um, Dr. Burnett, I know that you've been here long enough, and, and we're talking about policies, we're talking about an equity tool, um, and I'm glad you began to break it down because, brother, you were using some big words there for a moment, um, <laughs> some of that bu bureaucratic lingo, and I was like, okay, we're going to have to break that down and unpack that. However, when you talk about policies and you're talking about equity tools, let's, let's just cut to the quick. Gentrification, the most economic segregated city in the United States. The displacement of people of color from, well, and some people are calling it the second exodus, with the first exodus happening back in the early 1900s with the city plan that moved African Americans to East Austin and, and also moved Hispanics to different places in the city. So the city actually had policies that exacerbated that, that facilitated that. As you all know, you're at HT, you're in the community. So how do you deal with that? First of all, when I was first, re I've been here, I'll be, it'll be two years in July, and when I was researching Austin and the university, the university zip code 78702 um, through Google, the, you know, that's where you find everything. Uh, <laughs> that's a verb. Um, <laughs> um, they, it, Google told me that Austin- That's a person. That's a person, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, that 78702 had the highest amount of gentrification in the nation outside of New York City. That's pretty astounding. So I knew I was coming to a university that was in a highly gentrified area, and I didn't quite know how to interpret that. So as I, when I got to Austin and began to learn about Austin, and someone told me about the plan, and I went to research and read the plan, it helped me to understand why there was so much pain around gentrification that didn't occur in other cities that are being gentrified. Um, and with DC, New York, Atlanta, Boston, even cities that have high gentrification, they've embraced their, um, the community, the original community, mm -hmm. in a way that Austin had not because of Austin's history. Mm -hmm. So to respond to your question, um, it's going to take a while because first of all, that healing has to happen. People are very angry. Um, we've had several forums on campus to talk about the issue of regentrification, the issue of gentrification, the issue of um, racism, and the university can serve as an honest broker. And one of the things that I'm really emphasizing as the president of Houston Tillerson is that we play a role to maintain the important culture and history in that area, irrespective of how people think that there are no more black people living in, or people of color, particularly black people living in East Austin, mm -hmm. that's not true. I see them every day. They're people that we want to avoid. They're people that we want to act like they don't live there. But I live in East Austin, I work, play in East Austin, and um, I come to work in the morning at the corner of 12th and Chicane, or Chicken, as my GPS says it. Um, <laughs> the, corner of, the corner of 12th and Chicane, I'll see you know, something very ironic. I'll see a white female jogging with her baby and her dog, and then I'll see the brother sitting under what my husband calls a tree of knowledge, um, clearly with, in a very destitute place in his life. And I, you can see that in one visual image, and that's just not okay. It, it's, it, so right. people are disappearing, right. mm -hmm. but we're allowing that to happen because right. um, we, we're pretending like it happened and it's over. And even on the steering committee of the task force, there was con, um, considerable um, disagreement because we had developers that thought that they had done a good thing to rid East Austin of crime and you know what what people say happened to East Austin. And then you have people who lived in that community and can no longer afford their homes, very real stories, that they had a very different impression. So through very courageous and continuous conversations, people need to talk to each other so that you can see the impact that you didn't even see. You had an intention, but it had a very different impact on people's lives. And, I th and the, the, the report speaks to much of that, to say that this is still happening, so either we can continue to let it happen to Austin, or we can do the very hard work to stop it from happening across the city and other areas. And, and to that point, the, the one thing, I, I go to church uh, on East 11th Street, and you know, as you say, there can be the white woman jogging, the, um, 
the folks walking in their shorts and sandals, the whites walking, and we are dressed to the T to go to church. And as we pass each other on the sidewalk, I have noticed that African Americans will speak, but they will not make eye contact with us. The, 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 the gentrifiers, they will not make eye contact with us, they will not speak to us. So it is, it is not just the gentrification, but it's the isolation and it's the division. It, it, it's as if they don't see us. And, and I will say that on any given Sunday, you're going to see a whole lot of black people in East Austin because the churches are still there. Mm -hmm. So, Mayor, we're talking about, in the report, it, it talks about the right to stay. And I'd like you to chat a little bit about that because I also think there ought to be a right to return. I think so, too. <clears throat> I think that your, your, your goal when you're trying to live in a city with a high quality of life has certain attributes. And among those attributes are, are diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, among those attributes are, are equity. Uh, you have diversity and equity when you have different kinds of people in your city, all over your city. Uh, the goal, I think, is, is one that um, um, Sorry. That, that, Sorry, that, my mom's in ICU. Okay. <laughs> the, the goal is one that, that I think we can all embrace. The difficulty comes in finding what is the path and what are the tools in order to be able to get there. In Texas, as a city, we don't have a lot of the tools that cities, most cities have across the country because our legislature has taken those tools away from cities. That's right. So the ways to be able to institutionalize equity or to institutionalize diversity or to institutionalize mixed income opportunities have been stripped from us. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was real disappointing to see that this one of the new tools right, this session too. That, that we had wanted to, to talk about and see if we could pioneer, all we had to do was mention it in the report. And quite frankly, it is the one aspect of this report uh, that where we caused harm. Uh, by mentioning it? You mean the linkage fees? Is that what you're talking about? By mentioning about? it. Mm -hmm. By mentioning the tool, which is a tool to, to promote mm -hmm. equity and diversity and to institutionalize that, wow. was something that came out in the middle of the legislative session. And the legislature preemptively, this session, took away our right to be able to use a tool that we hadn't even used yet. Mm -hmm. We had just talked about using much less taking away from us tools to do rent controls or to do inclusive zoning so that when somebody gets zoned to do residential structure, they, part of the deal is you have to put a certain amount toward homes that people can afford. So we live in a city where, because of state law, the tools that many cities use we don't have, which just true. means which just means that we have to then be a little bit more creative. More creative, but, but I have a night. I, I just wonder about something, and, and, and I want to give everybody a, an opportunity to talk, and maybe Brian Al, and Albert can answer this question. But I, you know, it seems like sometimes we're not really using the tools that we have. Um, por ejemplo, we have um, central health, right? Central health is supposed to be a hospital district, um, as Bob knows that. Uh, people in the audience knows that. Um, that's how it was uh, set up with legislation. It's still, by definition, a hospital district, but we no longer have a hospital. But Brackenridge Hospital once belonged to the city of Austin. It was a, it was a taxpayer's asset, the land and the hospital. Now it belongs to Central Health. They are developing it, and the closest that they've come to talking about affordable housing is in an RFQ, meaning that when the RFP comes along, it may or may not be there. And only that has been done by a lot of pressure. So they got this asset for free. It belonged to us. And how is it that the city, the chief equity officer, 
the policy advisor, the mayor, the president of HT cannot bring pressure on Seton, on Central Health, excuse me, not on Seton, but Central Health, to make sure that there's affordable units on when that RAC track is developed. That's the kind of action that also needs to happen when you're talking about policies. And, and yes, tools have been taken away, but there are still some tools in the toolbox. I'll let anybody jump in. I, 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 I'll jump in right quick, just to say one very quick thing. That's where citizens, like everyone in this room, comes into play. Because um, you have a voice. And once I, this young man stopped me and said, I know you're the co-chair of the task force, you need to hold the mayor accountable. And after I processed that, my response was, the mayor can't fix this. It's up to everyday people that read and see these mm -hmm. kinds of things happen and sit back and wait for someone else to do it. Because that became very clear with the task force that um, people don't realize the voice that they have. And no vote is a vote. That's true, and I appreciate that. But let me just jump in and say, but the, I, I believe the city and the county both select the board for central health. So, there is the, so the pressure can also come from the mayor and the county commissioners and the city uh, policy advisors and people who recognize that and say that's something we can do. We can put that pressure, it, the pressure can come to, from the mm -hmm. top. It's not just you know the activists, we have some sitting here uh, uh, in, in the audience, it's not just them. It, it is pressure that has to, is that right? Am I, am I right, Gavino? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. right? and he's been on the front lines a long time, the, the, the pressure has to come from the top too. They, you, they have to wield their power to say, we are, not gonna, we are not going to allow this board to build with our asset a development that only caters to the, the, the wealthy or the upper middle class. And, and I'd like to hear from Brian, what, what policy and equity tool do you have to address that? So one of the things that we're working on with, within the city is to prioritize and look at how you consciously set goals to advance racial equity. And I think what happens a lot of times within institutions is that there's never really the real conversation around what is our vision, what is our goal, and how do we actually get there? And so one of the things that we're doing with the city is that our council and mayor adopted six uh, priority outcome areas to really sort of help us focus our work. And within those six uh, outcome priority areas, we're consciously looking at where the inequities are within those areas. And as the equity office, as it moves forward, those are going to be the benchmarks and the goals that we set, set forward for the city in terms of how do we consciously achieve it. And so I would say that I'm not an expert on, on central, central health and, and the way that they've sort of carried out their strategic plan. But I would say that if leadership never has the discussion to consciously say, how do we set goals? When are we going to do it by? And hold, our, hold, hold themselves accountable to it, then you never really get there, right? And you never really have that conversation around the decisions that you make and, and whether or not they actually advance racial equity or are they, right. or they hinder it, right? right? And, and so it starts from the very beginning and baking it into to your and goal and your mission, late. right? It's not too late to have that conversation with them, and I hope you do. And Alba, I'd like yeah. to hear from you and I'd love to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my origin to this seat um, comes from doing community work mm -hmm. and deep community organizing. Um, and so I don't take lightly um, what you're calling out as what needs to be a partnership um, when we do this work. Um, no side can do it alone because it takes a tremendous amount of pressure um, from all sides to turn a gigantic shift of institutionalized racism um, that we have been living with for hundreds of years. I think um, part of what we need to do is to begin to redefine what return on investment means. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. For a very long time, we have talked about um, a return on investment as what profits can be made, um, and typically because of the institutionalized um, nature of racism, those profits are not going um, to the people, as, as you are calling out. Mm -hmm. um, a big impetus 
for the publishing of this report um, was to begin to redefine that, right? And to begin to uh, publicly talk about it and to bring the language of um, what all of us activists and organizers are talking about with each other all of the time to places where that is not typically talked about. When we presented um, this report, so we're in a process of creating this change and creating this new language and redefining what it means to use our assets and our ROI. And admittedly, we are not there yet because this is something that, um, that perhaps in the past we had not been working in partnership to do, we That's had correct. been working in silos mm -hmm. to do, correct. or we had been working within the hierarchy that exists that keeps these structures in place. And so now we're taking the work across that hierarchy to bust up that hierarchy. But when we presented um, this report uh, to council um, to be um, approved and adopted and essentially assigned to the city manager, um, one of the council members, it was very striking, um, a non-minority um, council member in terms of race, literally said, from this day forward, everything that we have to look at and decide needs to be taken with the lens that this reports take. This is now our lens. But it has to be more, as you said, the silo, and that, mm -hmm. that's what I'm concerned about. It has to be greater than the mm -hmm. city the city and the county, and I know the mayor is just so wonderful in, in building consensus, and I, I have watched him do it in this city, and I'm so glad we have a smart consensus building mayor. Um, it has come in handy many times, especially at the legislature, and, and as well as in Washington, D.C., the way he's gone and fought for this city and fought for each, and what, each, each of us, um, uh, both citizens and undocumented people. Um, but it can't just be that the city um, is on its own. There has to be partnerships, as you say. So I look at that and say, you guys have got to reach across to, to Central Health mm -hmm. and get in their business. And you've got to reach across to the University of Texas, Muni, and get in its business, as the mayor has done. And the, the other thing is you talk about the right to stay or the right to return. And the demolitions in East Austin are, they go on. And what frustrates me is, you know, I, we finally have a historical survey, and I'm very grateful we do, because demolitions were taking place and people didn't know whether they were, you know, demolishing history, and they were, or not. And it was a very easy thing to demolish anything in East Austin. Very difficult on the west side. Very, very difficult on the west side to get, to get things demolished. Very easy on the west side to get um, something tagged as a landmark. Okay, Something tagged as a landmark and then get the, the tax incentives that go with that. So on the east side, when a building um, was taken to the city departments to be evaluated, it was evaluated for its redevelopment value. Okay, not, I'm talking about to the historical commission, right? To the historical department. They evaluated East Austin properties based on their redevelopment value, not on the criteria that laid out. That's why Rosewood is in danger. So when we talk about equity, why isn't that equity kind of dribbling down to historic sites before we lose the culture. You want to preserve culture. Mayor, you know, that question is for you. Why aren't we seeing that needle move when it comes to East Austin property? The black school, the uh, Montopolis school is now in danger. I think it is dribbling down. I think it's moving down. And I think it's moving down because there has been now, and I think there exists now in our community within our city and with the elected city officials, there is a greater focus on having equity uh, lens applied to everything that we do. I think it was what Brian said. I can't think of anything we do on the city council right now that among the city council members, it's not a filter that we, that, that not only is there in an amorphous way, 
it is a pointed part of every conversation we have on everything that we do. Let me give you some statistics then. 600 historic sites in, 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 in Austin, 600 city landmarks. 40 are associated with African Americans and Alba 13 are associated with Latinos. That's our city. So how is it dribbling down and saving something like the Montopolis School, saving something like Rosewood Courts when really the, they were ready to be demolished until there was you know, intervention by several parties? And I hate to say, but your predecessor signed off on that. I'm not my predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the co-chair of the task force. <laughs> I think that you, you identify what is a continuing problem in the city. Uh, but this is also a city that, for the very first time, now has an equity officer. Uh, we didn't have an equity officer until just now. This is a city that's taken significant city resources and created a, 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 an East Spirit of East Austin project. This is a city that has created this report. Uh, this is a city that is actively engaged right now in the resolution of the, the, of the Negro school. Um, if, if we're going to get graded on whether we have completed the task, we will fail. And we, and we, we get a failing rate. But are, are things different? Is the conversation different today than the conversation was two years ago? I think the answer to that is yes. Are there things that are happening today that were not happening two years ago? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, the issue of, the, of, of what happens with uh, central health is, a, is an issue that this entire city uh, is engaged right now in ways that might not have happened two years ago and four years ago. And I don't know if the, I, you know, I, and I'll go to my kind of consensus building place on, on the issue that you raised. Uh, I don't know that the right answer is to put affordable housing on that site. I don't know that. But what I do know is that we need a conversation in the community that talks about how to use that community asset in the absolute best way to drive equity, to drive the ability for all parts of our community to be able to live in all parts of our community. I don't know that if I have a choice of putting one family in the Austodian Hotel or, or 10 families within 400 feet of the Austonian Hotel, I choose to put the one family in the Austonian Hotel. Because but that's not the trade-off, Mayor. It really is not. Um, because we, we talk about this, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to have to, to stop right there and say, all of these developments that have been built downtown, developers had the opportunity. They had the opportunity to either make affordable units or pay fees in lieu. Okay, And those fees in lieu have not come to very much money. So it wasn't about having you know, 10 affordable units in uh, one development or having all this money to build 20. That wasn't the trade-off. And because we took the fee in lieu, we let them off cheap, we let them off you know, easy, we could have had scattered ho housing uh, in downtown Austin, affordable units, and every bit does help. Now we have these fees and the, and the land is so expensive it's hard to even, you have to go way outside the city to build something. I agree with that a okay. thousand percent, but, the, but, the, but I'm not here to defend uh, the last systems, the, the, the system that, that we are trying to change, which is why on June 16th, the city will see a new density bonus program for exactly that reason, mm -hmm. because the density program that we had in the city did not go through that lens. There was not the evaluation of it to say, is it in fact driving the outcome that we want? Because when you look at it that way, it, it, it failed. It did not work. But you, you said something, and excuse me for one second, and I, I want to get Alba to respond to that because I think we, we view things differently. We, we view things differently because you're talking about getting the most use out of Brackenridge, the Brack track to do thus and thus and so and thus and so. And I'm talking about putting your mouth where, putting your money where your mouth is, saying that 
This is, our, this is what Austin believes. We believe people of color should be living here along with the doctors, nurses, whatever, um, who are going to be li living there. We believe people of color should be able to live downtown Austin on this track that we once owned and was a an taxpayer asset and you got for free. Now, when I asked Central Health, they told me, well, you know, Alberta, you know, we have to do, our main thing is health, so we have to make sure that whatever we develop is health and, and, and we serve, you know, poor people. And I'm like, so you don't think housing is part of health? You don't think environment is part of health? So, Alba, I would like to hear from you about the idea that we should just allow, like the mayor says, that track to be developed and maybe be used in some other way. And by the way, I was not recommending that. Okay. <laughs> I was saying that is the conversation that we as a community need to have. Okay, right. fair enough. Well, and part of it is that that is a conversation that we as a community now get to have um, because we have brought transparency to the issues of racism. And I don't say that to say that this is the first time that we are talking about race. Those of ours who are of race and at the bottom of that racial hierarchy have been talking about that all along. Um, but we get to have that conversation with the context of racialization now um, and to um, make that part of the um, ROI that we've been talking about tonight um, because we've got um, folks like the mayor who are saying, this is my task force. Um, this is what we need to be talking about. Um, so I think that it is an ongoing component on that and we want to hear people um, talking about that. We're not um, shying away from that um, as a city. Um, and in fact, uh, I keep going back to the day that we presented um, the task force plan. But you know, the other thing that was on the agenda for the work session of council that day was the housing um, plan. And the um, council members stood up and said, actually, there's a whole chunk of this task force report that is missing from that planned housing department, mm -hmm. right? And that is the beginning of being able to publicly have that conversation in the halls of power in a way that it hasn't been before. And that's, that's wonderful. Right? So we hope that if this is one of the first cases out of the gate, right, that so. has come post this plan, mm -hmm. uh, that that will be incorporated. Thank you. I want to ask Dr. Burnett and um, Mr. Oaks or Brian. Um, there was a question somebody submitted to me about banking and finance. Since the city ha doesn't really have uh, control or authority or regulate those industries, um, why include them? What can they really do? What was the purpose? And I'd like to ask you, should they have been included and why? And what, it, what are your thoughts about that? What can the city do? Two things. Um, the five pillars, if you will, that were chosen for the working groups, there was a lot of discussion that went on behind that. That didn't just happen. And the, the thought, how we got to that, was that each of those areas hold up a community, mm -hmm. individually and collectively. And you made a really good point earlier that I want to really make sure I lift, is that no area stands alone. Um, the report says that if you are poor, you can't get a loan. It dictates where you live. It dictates the quality of education, and they eventually can dictate your health. So there's this interrelation among those five working groups. One of the, one of the working groups was um, police, and one of the judges that's on the steering committee um, raised to our, brought to our attention that it really isn't about police brutality. It's about the civil and criminal justice system, and that's how that became one of the pillars. And the second part of that, um, the banking uh, group we had several bank, well, we had bank presidents on the steering committee. It was really a, a good mixture of people from all walks of life. And they as a group have decided to do things collectively and to look at um, the way loans are, pro the way loans are done, the way loans are um, uh, processed through their systems collectively. And normally banks are very competitive. 
<laughs> so for them to say, we want to sit in one room, and, and if nothing else comes of this, there have been things like that that have happened to what I consider move the, the needle forward and to have a ray of hope. Because as a black female, when, when black people get together, all we talk about is white people. <laughs> we spend a lot of time talking about what white people are doing to us. And I don't think white people get together and talk about black people. <laughs> so, um, like all the time at a party. And uh, you know, I say that broad brush, but generally the conversation eventually tends to move to that because we, it's something that we live with 100% you know, of the time, like the mayor was talking about earlier. So this task force is not to dismantle racism. Um, we'd have a magic wand and we'd be, we'd be wealthy if we could figure more than wealthy. It's a continuation of a lot of hard work that's already happened by um, people whose voices have not been heard. Mm -hmm. It's easy to change policy, et cetera, for wealthy people. It's very complicated and hard and very courageous to do things for people that um, are not wealthy or people that don't have a voice. And that's what I was speaking about earlier, that everyday people have to do that in your every walk of life. So for the task force, it's a, the next step. Dr. Cruz and I had to call people to see if they would serve on the steering committee. Mm -hmm. And I received responses from activists in the community that said, oh, not another task force. You know, I don't want to do this again. Austin is famous for task forces, but okay, I'll try it this time. And those same individuals, by the end of this process, were had a, a, um, a very hopeful attitude that maybe because we have the leader of the city um, championing this, and we had people on the, on the um, task force who had not really thought about their own privilege and how in their walk, in their life, how they hire, what vendors they work with, um, through this courageous conversations training to, to come into um, touch with your own self. Because it really has to happen at a very personal level on how you walk through your own life. So it's not to dismantle racism, and racism is going to be gone in Austin in a month or a, week, or a month or a year. It's to begin the process of moving the, an entire community forward. Because we can be a prosperous city, but we're not really a prosperous city if everyone is not having the opportunity to prosper. Because we may be equal as a nation, but we, we're, there's no equity. And there's a huge difference between equality and equity. Um, and if you're not a person who doesn't feel like you're not treated equitably, you don't really think about it. Right. So the purpose of this was to raise the, the, the lens almost, because this nation built the TSA, mm -hmm. an entire branch of the government, which takes an act of Congress, um, almost overnight, because we responded to fear. We chose to do that because we responded to fear. Until people who are not affected by it feel it in a very deep way, then we won't invest in making these changes. So it's 70 pages. That's what the report is. It's got over 200 recommendations in it um, because the mayor's charge to us was to include every recommendation so that every voice could be heard. Most people that criticized the report, I had someone criticize the report, and then at the end of our conversation, he said, where do I find it? I said, <laughs> you haven't even read it. Um, so people need to read it That's because awesome. it, it lifted, it, right, so it, it lifts your awareness and in your own walk, whether you're with the health system or education or whether you're a, a banker in the, F, the, we call it the FBI, the finance banking industry, <laughs> that's ironic, um, arm of the task force, um, read it. It's, it's 70 pages and it's, it has a wealth of information which just lifts the way people think. It just changes your perspective. Irrespective of you know, your socioeconomic status, irrespective of your education level, irrespective of your, your race, your gender, your ethnicity, it just makes you aware of how far we have to go as a city mm -hmm. to make changes. And, and it is a ray of hope. And I've seen an awakening because we've been asked to speak about this um, in several forums. And so people are interested. People genuinely want to know. Like I said earlier, it's really not about racist people. People. It's about you being engaged in a racist system, um, whether you work in a school, whether you work um, for an um, in, in industry, a startup, just process your own walk and how you're, you're interacting and acting on your own privilege. 
So I think she handled that question very she well. Did. Right? <laughs> so, I'm going to move to the criminal justice question for you because we have a criminal justice system here in Austin and Travis County, and disproportionate number of African Americans and Latinos, and particularly African Americans, the numbers are really staggering, um, are in jail, um, incarcerated. And yet, you know, and, and there's a whole dis discussion about this. There seems to be synergy by conservatives and by liberals about reforming criminal justice. But there's not been a whole lot of movement uh, in the system because the results don't show that movement. Um, we have had a little bit of progress, the sobriety center, um, drug courts, a little bit of progress. But even the drug courts turned out to be racist. So give me your perspective on how we move that needle. So I think one of the most disturbing things for me uh, in Austin is that African Americans, we represent 8% of the population, but I think about 22% of the arrest. And so um, we like to do a calculation that we, we call sort of disproportionality or, or the over or under representation. And so when you look at that, uh, being black in Austin, you are 235% more likely to be uh, booked and taken to jail. And so for, for me, I think we have to consciously begin to look at um, how do we sort of address the bias that is within our criminal justice system? And how do we sort of look at policy opportunities to really kind of get at uh, having better equitable outcomes as it relates to the criminal justice system? And so. I almost feel like it's, it's one of those, those things that the community can really get involved in in terms of um, accountability standards you know, that, that, that we set for law enforcement and our police departments, right? Um, it also sort of takes uh, community being aware and, aware and conscious about those opportunities to really sort of make their voice be heard uh, when those windows sort of open up you know, for the community to get engaged. Um, but I think it's really for us to really consciously think about how do we really address the root cause of, of what we see in the system and, and knowing that, there, that there's areas to fix in the system because we're seeing the outcomes um, that are disproportionate at the end of the day. And so what would be, Alba, one recommendation that if you could give to APD Austin Police Department, as well as to the Travis County Sheriff's Office about the criminal justice system? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think um, there are many recommendations in the report um, mm -hmm. to be um, taken very seriously. Um, but you know, um, some years back, uh, the Justice Crescent Descent, uh, Decree came down. Um, um, on the fire department, for example, and we've had um, other things that have come down on APD and et cetera, um, all of these um, units of public safety. And so a big um, attention needs to be paid to um, who is wearing those uniforms, um, what their training and awareness is, um, whether we are um, steering that ship in the dir direction of um, militarization or whether we're steering that ship um, to really do uh, public safety, and public safety um, looks many ways. Um, when I was um, involved with um, community organizing, one of the things that we brought to council was to think about um, the assets a little bit differently and to think about what else constitutes um, public safety. And we talked about things like lighting in the neighborhoods, um, things like after school programs and all sorts of um, different investments that aren't typically thought about public safety. And we brought the case of a police officer who's involved um, with the Police Activities League. The Police Activities League um, is literally police <coughs> officers who run um, programming in neighborhoods. Um, they do soccer, they do um, 
basketball, they do all sorts of different things. And it's a completely different way to think about the role um, and therefore to think about who the residents are in your community and me, what your relationship you is with them. Let me stop there and interject something because, mm -hmm. so just this past week, my husband happens to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So he got this case from a friend. It's a friend's kid, 18 years old. Um, he was smoking a joint in the park. He's African American with some white kids. So the police come along, they smell the marijuana, and all the kids are doing it. He goes and he searches the black kid's car, he finds the marijuana, and he arrests the black kids, mm -hmm. the black kid. Now, he never searched the white kid's car. He only searched the two, the, the one black kid's car. So he was the only one arrested. Mm -hmm. So the others got to go home. And that's not an uncommon thing. Mm -hmm. So when you say the community has to see the police a certain way, the police have no, to see I the say community the a certain way. The police needs to see the community a certain way, right? Right. That we need to begin shifting the way that police and people in uniform think about our community, right? Are you thinking about your community as people that you are serving and protecting? Um, and are you thinking about being a part of your community a way that um, you are an integral part? that you are there um, with people in their experiences, or are you criminalizing them? So I was exactly saying okay. the opposite, right? right? And the example of the um, police officer being involved in that, in, in that community, um, I do wanna um, give the name of that officer. Her name is Officer Paula Aguilar, and she is a model because she has brought hundreds of kids together um, in this type of programming, and is spending her time doing that in a way that says, I see you as children that need to have these experiences. I don't see you as criminals waiting to fill beds in prison. So precisely the opposite, Alberta. But Mayor, um, do they really think we are the community when almost what? Well, two at least two thirds of them live outside the city. Do they really see us as their community? They live in Kyle, they live in Buda. Um, I've seen, as far as Fort Worth, um, I've seen um, up, I don't know, western, far western Travis County, well, beyond Travis County, Burnett County. Can they really see us as the community? They're, we're not the Boy Scout, Girl Scout troop that, um, that they're involved with, you know? Um, some police officers, when I've interviewed them, told me, I would never live in the city of Austin. There's too much crime. A police officer told me that. Um, I would never send my child to an Austin school. There are no good schools. A police officer told me that. Um, so do they, can they really see us as a community? Not the way they would if they lived in the community. Right. And, and what can we do about that? Well, uh, for the first time, uh, the, the council is taking a much more active role in the negotiation of the public safety contracts this year than I have ever seen happen in my time in the city of Austin. Uh, we basically have stopped the negotiations while we dis work through and, 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 and discuss those, those issues. I think that's going to be one of the issues that gets discussed. Council Member Houston has already raised that uh, uh, issue. Uh, but the larger issue, and just to touch on real fast, because uh, it looks like people are waving. Uh, they are. What precipitated this report at this time was not only the general need for this report, because every moment of time has been the right time. But what precipitated this was the events that happened a summer ago. Um, um, the, the, the last incident, there were two incidents. There was the, the black child naked running down the street that was shot, and there was the woman who was uh, being uh, tossed around like a dog. Breon King. And, and we were reflexively as a community, because we're a good community, went to a place to have a, a gathered together people to, to have a good, meaningful conversation. 
And it was looking at having yet another meaningful conversation where we said, we can't do this again. We actually have to have specific things. But we started off talking about criminal justice, but in the conversations about how to tee up getting specific answers to deal with criminal justice, we realized that, you, that it goes back to the point that you made at the beginning, that, that perhaps one of the most significant things you can do on criminal justice is to, is to change access to capital, or to change housing, or to bring communities together. Uh, and, and in a very real sense, that's as much public, as you said, public safety spending as anything else. So this, this was began with, with criminal justice, and the way it manifested itself was in the five mm -hmm. pillars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the hope coming out of this report is to look at this issue and say, <coughs> it is in everything. It is in where we live, it's where our officers live. It is, it is everything, and it is pervasive, and it is the same thing in many different forms in as many different places. I did not ask the task force to focus on the city or what the city could do. In fact, the charge was specifically, don't do that. Look at our city, not city government, look at our, our city, and, 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 it, and if you will look at the recommendations, and a lot of these recommendations don't have anything to do with city action. And the fact that one of the first things that's actually happening in this community is the presidents of the banks are getting together to work through this chapter. The city's not do, making them do that. The county's not making them do that. The newspaper is not making them do that. This is having one or two evangelists who went through this experience with the president and with these heroes up here. And they said, this is our deal. This is, in, in their personal journey, this is our deal. And they are meeting collectively to, in a way that they never met collectively to do anything. And this is what they're focused on now. I, I applaud these folks with, for the work that they did because there are a lot of things that have gone wrong and there are a lot of policies we need to change. But, but I see signs that this is in fact constructive. Thank you, Mayor. Good place to, are we okay with questions? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I um, wanna let you know I am the new appointee for Central Health's Board of Managers. And <laughs> Would you like to have my chair? So I will stand up as being, first of all, the first Muslim to be on the board and understanding what racism is mm -hmm. and has experienced it. I will do everything that I can with my will to make sure the decisions that we make are right for our community, are just and equitable. And talking about housing, addressing social determinants of health is definitely a priority. And health is not within the walls of a doctor, it's outside. And that's all I want to say. I will do everything we can. Thank you. Thank you. The city. <laughs> Not only the newest member, but the city council's oh, appointee like to the board. <laughs> How much did you pay her? Thank you, uh, Mayor, for, for coming here. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name's Michael Lewis, and I've been living here in this community for uh, almost 30 years. And all of those, all of those years, I've seen people get their houses taken away over in East Austin because they cannot afford to pay the property taxes. And you stated that we don't have the tools that other cities might have. What can we do to have those tools necessary so that we don't have people getting pushed out of East Austin because they can't afford their property tax? Um, we, we don't have a lot of tools that the city says, but we do have tools mm -hmm. to, to, to go to, to Alberta's point, and we need to use them. Uh, we have the ability to do density bonuses where we give people additional 
opportunity to build and, and to get a commitment for them. We have homestead preservation districts. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to be able to take property off of the tax rolls. You know that we've talked about incentives in the city in the past where we've attracted big companies with big jobs. Uh, and we've, those are called 380 agreements. We've now asked the staff to go back and take and a whole new way we look at incentives. If there can be an incentive program that deals with property taxes for a big company moving in, why can't we have an incentive program that deals with property taxes on a lot? Yes. Now, the law was not written to allow for that. We're going to try that. And then I will tell you, two years from now, we will be fighting to keep that. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what, that maybe that's not what it was written to do, but we're going to use it that way. So it is, it is doing as many of those things as we can. We're trying to put together a strike fund now that doesn't have philanthropic dollars, that has investment dollars for a low return, but still a positive return. And while the, my July is going to be taken off trying to, to, to promote that, and. And, and, and make that go. So we have those opportunities too. It is, it, it's cobbling together as many of the little tools we do have and trying to use them in new and creative ways. I didn't mean to suggest that because we don't have those tools, we've given up because we haven't. Every bit of our energy and effort is directed toward maximizing the tools that we do have. Thank you. Th thank you, Mayor. I had the opportunity to talk to hundreds of people when I ran for office last year. And that was one of their major concerns. My concern was education because we, we do need to have more qualified individuals to get the good paying jobs that are coming to Austin. But they was really concerned about being moved, getting put out of their house because they could not afford the property tax. Thank you. Good evening, y'all. My name is Dorothy Gerritsen, and I had the privilege of serving in the education work group in the, in the task force. And a question that was brought up in our group frequently was students were at the table, students of color weren't at the table, parents weren't at the table. Communities, especially students and families of color, dealing disproportionate disproportionality and discipline weren't at the table. We, just the 40 of us or so, were in a group siloed, it felt like, creating these recommendations. And so my question from that experience and moving forward, how can we ensure that the task force as well as the equity tool are more open and not siloed so that the community, we all, but not just us in this room, but folks of color disproportionately impacted by all our institutions have a voice at the table. There were, um, it was very complicated to create the steering committee because we wanted to be diverse. So um, a lot of work went into diversifying that steering committee and even more work went into diversifying the working groups. Um, it makes me a little sad that you felt as an individual that those voices weren't heard because out of 40 people, um, we worked very hard to make the voices heard and not to be siloed. In fact, we had meetings after meetings opening it up so that people would continue to have their voices heard. Once the report was released, we encouraged people to read through it as working group members and then to add their input. So to ad address your, um, your concern, which is a... Um, extremely valid one. We want, if we, because Dr. Cruz and I have committed to stay engaged and to, to continue to work for, towards action, actioning these, these recommendations, at least some of them. So I keep that on top of my mind that people still feel that voices weren't heard. Because we, we work very hard to be sure that all voices are. It's very complicated. It's, yes. it's, it's very complicated. Um, it was like herding cats almost. Mm -hmm. Because everybody is busy. Right. Everybody's working. In fact, when the mayor called me um, one evening to ask me would I be engaged while he was talking in the mayor's way um, to get to what I knew he was going to ask me to be engaged with something. In my mind, I was thinking, I can't, I'm going to say no um, because I'm too busy. 
I mean, I, I'm working at an institution that we're, we're, we're challenged. We're very challenged. We have a wonderful mission, but we're challenged because of all these things that we're talking about today. But my heart was saying you would be a hypocrite to say no because I talk about people that talk about stuff but don't do it. Like, I get very frustrated when people say, oh, I don't, I don't like the way this, this is happening. This is racist. And then when you say, well, what are you doing about it? I'm just talking about it. <laughs> so I didn't want to be one of those persons. So when the mayor finally got to the ask, um, my mind was like, no. But my heart said, yes, willingly, because it is important work. And so we need people to step up to the plate, to be engaged in it. So I encourage you, and it doesn't have to be with the mayor's task force. It could be um, very small things that you get engaged in. <clears throat> and so I understand, I too, the, top, the, the charge that I gave to this group again, because it was a pretty high caliber group. And thank you for participating on that working group. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had people that were participating in this that did not have the time to be able to participate in this, I dictated a process that would be up and down in like 90 days uh, because that's how we got both commitment to people and to a degree the work will always expand, expand the time mm -hmm. you have to do it, mm -hmm. recognizing that there were sacrifices and compromises that would be made in giving people such a short time to get something done. So I appreciate that. I, I own that. I created problems with setting up systems well that would have had this work better because I required that this be done fast. And the, the timeline was March 31st, and uh, which was 90 days, which felt extremely daunting. In hindsight, if we hadn't been given a timeline, we would still be talking. We'd still be meeting. We'd still be trying to involve other people. And we turned it in on March 31st like, what was it all about? <laughs> what, like 1.07 a.m.? 1.07 a.m., which was really March 31st. Because <laughs> right. um, I hadn't gone yeah. to sleep yet. Yeah, right. And then we didn't go to sleep, and then we came here, and we continue to go to other places and all sorts of places, um, church communities, um, venues like this. We're willing to take that anywhere, um, and not only to um, spread what's in there, but to talk about what's not in there and what needs to be um, continue to be built. Um, that needs to be in there. And even to the county. We've actually been to the county. Um, the county leadership has expressed mm -hmm. interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did, we did a The academic community, one of the questions I got was the, there was so much expertise from, on um, inequities and racial, racial inequities in the academic communities, and, and they weren't tapped to be part of the steering committee um, or whatever. Richard Reddick was on there. Right, Richard um, was. Uh -huh. And we had um, uh, Dr. Rhodes. Dr. Rhodes. Several mm -hmm. people from mm -hmm. ACC. Dr. Tang. Mm -hmm. um, from, and Dr. From my Tang. Own, and okay. from Dr. Mm -hmm. Tang, even from my own institution. So we, we just mm -hmm. couldn't include everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that, Those but are the great work, people. Right, but right. the work mm -hmm. continues. I mean, okay. it, it's, it, it wasn't like a, it's not a coffee table um, thing. <laughs> it has a beautiful cover. It's a beautiful <laughs> cover. <laughs> but it's not a coffee table item. It's a really a living and breathing document. And, and we're committed to not letting it die. Because in, in my own <clears throat> work, um, I, I see young people every day that are, have rays of hope. And they may um, be poor, some of them. But poor doesn't mean that you're not smart. It means you haven't been exposed. And this is all about giving opportunities and exposure <clears throat> mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to people who wouldn't normally have it. Right. And one of the other things that came out of the task force is we don't have enough data right. um, that really tells the real story. So mm -hmm. the charge is, back to institutions of higher education and other think tanks, mm -hmm. to really find more data about people of color, people mm -hmm. who are different than we, than we have already. <clears throat> so this is going to be our last question. So my question is about historical and institutional knowledge. With so many people moving to Austin these days, you talked a lot about the past and the idiosyncrasies that is Austin. What can be done to help inform folks who are moving to the city, for instance, why there's a community center in their bar district on Rainy Street? What can, be, why can, what can we do to inform people about the idiosyncrasies that is Austin? 
I think one of the things that I really appreciated about this report was that it really gave a lot of focus to the, to the historical um, uh, issue of race in, in Austin. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in the work that we're doing with our departments at the city is that um, acknowledging that, that history is the first step. You know, to know where you're going, you have to know where, you're, where you've been. And so for us, uh, that's one of the things that we want to really bake into to, to our training and our development for staff as we move forward so that they know that, that racial history in the city when they come on board to, to, to work for us. Uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of times what happens is that um, I like to say the community sort of gets amnesia about certain things as it relates to, to race. And so I always think that it's so important to keep that front and center and to really acknowledge you know, the, that history. And, and that's one of the things I really appreciated about this report, really kind of calling out things like the city's Couch and Fowler plan of, of 1928 and really sort of like explicitly talking about how that segregated uh, our city, uh, how that led to sort of devaluing a property. And if you think about it, uh, from that point on, you saw a, a systematic underinvestment uh, in the Eastern Crescent of, of this city. And I think that, that calling attention to that and just being truthful and, and, and honest and open about that is so important to do and, and not try to sort of cover over those things. And I'll add that um, part of it is having um, conversations about this in non-traditional places where this happens. Um, you could say that this space is a pretty traditional place for this type of conversation to happen if it's gonna happen anywhere in the city. Um, but part of what we did was, you know, the finance banking industry at first, it, it, it was like, we need to look at banking practices, right? And that was one of the things that we had a lot of awareness about. And then we sat back and thought, we need to add industry. What does industry mean? That means all of the tech industry and all of the other types of industry um, that are in the city. And we need to charge um, these folks to think about themselves as employers, right? And as the engines um, of the economic development of the community, a completely different way. Um, and what you're talking about is a need to take the conversation to those spaces so that people um, and institutions that don't traditionally feel like they have a dog in the fight, feel like they have a dog in the fight. Um, and so that's part of our work now um, as, you know, a second act, right? Um, the continuing act of, of where we're taking um, the conversations, um, who we're asking to uh, give us the air <coughs> space to have um, some time with them to, um, to think about themselves um, in a completely uh, different manner. So I would just add on the real fast, that question feels like nails on a blackboard to me. Why is there a community center in the middle of a bar district? I mean, that's a really good question. But the real question is, why is there a bar district in the middle of the community? Because that was the question that we wrestled with as a, as a, as a community. So I think the point that you make in that question is, is an incredibly salient point. Because if we don't know our history, don't we, we don't know who we are. Uh, and, and I can only say that, that uh, there are many of us that talk about this at every opportunity we can, as many different groups as we can, that, that, that one of the priorities while the city's moving forward and talking about doing a great Waller Creek linear park and people are talking about doing a convention center expansion, um, there are those of us that are saying none of those get to move forward until we use whatever economic momentum there is to not only fix the homelessness there at the Arch, but also to fund the completion of the MAC, that community center, that, that is that community on the ground. Um, my salient moment of this evening tonight is going to be that question. I was just going to simply add, um, <clears throat> we start the report off with a letter to the mayor, and in it we quote, we quote Congressman LBJ, mm -hmm. um, where he talks about that he loved Austin very dearly, but it was the tale of two cities. Mm -hmm. And the point there was we're still talking about this mm -hmm. um, several years later. So at what point do we as a community embrace it and say we're going to really 
move the needle mm -hmm. and make a change. And the quote was actually from Congressman LBJ. Yeah, so. and as I remember reading that, um, Austin was known as the city of the violet crown. crown. Right. And he said that there's a stain on the violet, cr right. violet crown. Right. So that, that was pretty impressive that he would say that at that time and that we yeah. are still talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's something that we'll probably talk about for a while, but we also need to move out of the talk stage mm -hmm. into the action stage. And that's going to, as you all said, build consensus and take all of us to do that. Mm -hmm. With that, I want to thank everybody. And uh, I think that ends the program.